what triggered this bizarre behavior. Journey into the cold heart of northern darkness with Nordic crimes. That case uh, became like a scene from a horror movie. A new true crime documentary series that chilled the bone. The hunger for killing is increasing in the course of these homicides. Listen on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Nordic Crimes is a part of the Acast family. Wow. Nice. Yeah. What you're hearing are the sounds of people everywhere putting on Bomba socks, underwear, and T-shirts made from absurdly soft materials that feel like plush clouds. Yeah, that plush. And the best part? For every item you purchase, Bombas donates another to someone facing homelessness. Bombas. Big comfort for everyone. Go to bombas.com slash ACAST and use code ACAST for 20% off your first purchase. That's bombas.com slash ACAST. Code ACAST. And welcome to episode number 229 of Real Life Ghost Stories. And to kick things off this week, I would like to say thanks to some of our newest Patreon subscribers. I would like to thank Tracy Reeves, Foop McGraw, Tremaine, Laura Irwin, and Tiani. Thank you so much for subscribing to the Patreon. I love you and appreciate you every single day. And our film review this week. Our film review is Frogman. Frogman was released in 2023. It is 4.7 out of 10 on IMDb and 52% on Rotten Tomatoes. Loveland, Ohio, home of the Frogman. In the summer of 1999, a 12-year-old named Dallas Kyle captured footage of the mythical creature, but no one believed it was real. 20 years later, Dallas, now an amateur filmmaker struggling to turn his passion into a career, returns to Loveland with friends Amy and Scotty, determined to obtain irrefutable proof that the Frogman exists. But what starts as an innocent documentary soon turns into a Lovecraftian nightmare, as Dallas uncovers the horrific secrets hidden beneath Loveland's idyllic surface. Can Frogman read minds? Does he really have a wand? Does Frogman fuck? One thing is certain, the croaks are no hoax. So I was tagged in a TikTok about this film by Cotton Schwab 45 Hello, if you're listening. And I was tagged on TikTok and I watched the TikTok, which was about this film. And I sort of thought, absolutely, I want to watch this film. I'm going to find this film and I'm going to watch it. I actually watched it on Daily Motion, but I'm pretty sure that you can watch this on YouTube also. I absolutely love the story of the Loveland Frogmen of Ohio. If you don't know the story, I'm going to give you the brief rundown. So this is a real cryptid case. I covered it on Patreon a good few years ago. And it's just, it's just such a great story, right? Basically, these people are out driving and they see what they, what looks like two frogs, frogmen on their hind legs standing at the side of the road And they appear to be carrying wands that are emitting sparks out of the end of them, right? The frogs see the people and they're like, whoa, we got to get out of here. So, you know, serious frog business, humanoid frogs carrying wands. Like, it's incredible. I love it. This is not an isolated event. So other people claim to have seen the frogman of Loveland in Ohio. There are other conversations down the river about people seeing frog people there was one woman who was grabbed and dragged underwater while swimming in the river by what she claimed was a frogman so there's lots of frogman business going on right and just to reiterate that's the real allegedly real story of the loveland frogmen of ohio right so this film i thought great we're we're getting a film based on an obscure cryptid and i am all for it and dallas and his sister the story is that back in like 1999 they were on holidays with their mom and dad they stopped and dallas and his sister got out of the car dallas is filming and they capture footage 
of the frogman and then that footage went viral and years later that footage is used in various you know frogman of ohio compilation videos on youtube and stuff and people are generally like he didn't see it it's a hoax it's a fake and then dallas decides I need to prove to everybody that this wasn't a hoax. I need to prove to people that this really happened. And he decides that he is going to film the the, the documentary on the same camera that he used when he was a kid. That is a fun touch. So what you get is this gorgeous Blair Witch type film footage. You get this Blair Witch quality film footage. And I think as as a film that is really it's an homage to found footage horror films like Blair Witch having an older camera quality and older camera style really worked the three main characters are frankly really likable like while I was watching them I was thinking about the fact that in these found footage horror films it's often that these these characters they they end up not being very likable they're filming when you think just fucking stop filming and run you're filming at the detriment of your friends you're filming and everyone's going to die and it's going to be your fault you're actually not a very nice character but these three characters they 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 are good friends they seem to be good people you're rooting for them the whole way through and a lot of the film is based around interviews with people in Loveland which are great because some of them are wacky some of them are ridiculous some of them are really fun some of them are really serious and I just I do you know what I really enjoyed myself watching this film I really enjoyed myself but that is coming from someone who loves a found footage horror film I also love a creature feature and I love anything that pays pays its respects to films like the Blair Witch Project because those were such seminal films And they are horror films that really change the game in relation to found footage horror films. And considering the Loveland frog men of Ohio, like that's a pretty ridiculous cryptid to try and make a kind of semi-serious found footage horror film about. I think they did a really, I think they did a really good job. They seem to have found a really good balance of earnestness and sort of tongue-in-cheek silliness and I I respected it you know I thought I don't feel like I've wasted my time watching this in terms of dislikes I'm actually not going to be too harsh on this film I don't think I I'm getting quite frustrated watching horror films at the moment particularly new releases I feel like the big budget horror films that are coming out particularly from places like Bloomhouse they're not they're not very good they're not very creative they're not very inventive they're not new they're not fresh they're not exciting and they're they're sort of silly and not not in a good way i don't know what the budget was for this film but i can imagine that it was absolutely ridiculously low and i feel like they created something that was really fun and re- and really different with a really small budget just to be just to be really clear like the effects in the film are like often it is somebody in a frog suit do you know what i mean they're like the effects are silly and they're not necessarily very good but they really stuck to the image that has always been given of the loveland frog man like they didn't try and make him like horrific and really scary and and something that is akin to like the predator or whatever they they stuck to what the image of the frog man is based on the original eyewitnesses accounts and it adds to the charm of the film you're looking at this person in a frog suit and you're thinking oh this is ridiculous but i love it and when i was originally reading the synopsis where it was like does frogman fuck i was like ew no i hate this already and i'm just i'm just gonna say it all right that question is actually relevant for for the film that is not just something that they threw in there to be to be cute and edgy. No, no, that is a relevant part of the story. And it comes up earlier in the story in one of the Vox Bops that they have from, they have a chat with some some guy in the street and he, he talks about Frogman having sex. As you guys know, I am somebody who will read cryptid erotica. And the reason I do that is, I don't know, maybe because, maybe because I like self-flagellation. Maybe I hate myself. I don't know why, okay? But Loveland, Frogmen having sex is a is a part of this story just i'm just putting it out there there's also a lot of goo in the story there's a lot of general goo and um i'm not i'm not a fan of goo 
in horror films in in any in any iteration of goo goo and me are not friends i don't enjoy anything goo related i don't enjoy witnessing anything goo related so i found the uh, goo heavy parts of this film quite tricky I will also say that this film um, does the same thing that a lot of found footage horror films do in that it's a really slow burn, but the last 20 minutes is absolutely wild. Like the last 20 minutes is <laughs> insane. And you know what? I'm allowing it because fair play to them. Besides the frog sex and the goo, fair play to them. I'm going to give this this film four stars. I don't know why I'm giving it four stars. I think it's inventive. I think it's fun. I think fair play to them. They did something that was really enjoyable to watch on a budget and who can fault people for making films about frog sex so that's four stars for frogman head over to hulu this march where our new shows and movies will keep you streaming all month long catch the award winning movie poor things starring emma stone mark ruffalo and willem dafoe Check out the new documentary, Freaknik, The Wildest Party Never Told, about the iconic Atlanta street party. And don't miss FX's Shogun, a reimagining of the epic tale starring Anna Sawai. So, what are you waiting for? Go stream something new on Hulu. Hey everyone, I'm Craig Robinson, co-host of the Ways to Win podcast, alongside my good friend John Calipari. I've been on the go recently. Phoenix, Kansas City, Chicago. If you're like me and have a home but aren't always at home, you have an Airbnb. Hosting your home or a spare room is a very practical side hustle. If you live in a big game town, you can Airbnb your place for fans to stay in. Your home might be worth more than you think. Find out how much at Airbnb.com slash host. Which brings us to our story this week, which is not about sexy frogs. You'll be, some of you will be glad to know, others will be devastated. I, I bear no judgment either way. Our story today is the story of a man named Chico Xavier. Now, I had never heard of this person. And then somebody submitted this as a like request for a topic. I'm sorry, I didn't write down your name, whoever you are. But Chico Xavier was was put into one of those requests for topics. So let's deep dive into his story. He is a very interesting man. Two years ago, I went to a seance in the most haunted village in the world. It was a strange experience to say the least. And I will admit that when the Ouija board was whipped out, a part of me did wonder what I would do if that planchette moved. It didn't. At least not in a way that seemed to demonstrate anything paranormal. But besides that, we did do something unexpected and something that I was aware of and genuinely thought was a trick consigned to the past. We did some automatic writing. According to Wikipedia, and I quote, automatic writing, also called psychography, is a claimed psychic ability allowing a person to produce written words without consciously writing. Practitioners engage in automatic writing by holding a writing instrument and allowing alleged spirits to manipulate the practitioner's hand. We were asked to meditate, to attempt to clear our mind and allow any potential spirits to guide our hand and write any messages that they may want to impart. You'll be shocked to learn that I channeled no spirits and I wrote nothing on my little piece of paper. I was admittedly very disappointed. Automatic writing is something that I've been interested in for years. You may not know, but poetry is kind of my thing, and I was and still am fascinated by the lives of various poets. W.B. Yeats being one of those poets. And also, if you didn't know, Yeats was obsessed with the paranormal. When Yeats was 52, he married 25-year-old Georgie Hyde Lees. He proposed to her after a series of ego-shattering rejections and while on their honeymoon, Yates was bruised and brooding. But guess what? As it turned out, Georgie realised on this honeymoon that she was a dab hand at automatic writing. 
Georgie Hyde Lees and William Butler Yeats conducted approximately three automatic writing sessions a week for the entirety of their marriage. She wrote around 4,000 pieces of writing dictated by the spirits, including imagery and metaphors that were used in Yeats's poetry. Of course, there have been many questions over the validity of the claims that Georgie was communing with spirits. But this is obviously not the only example of automatic writing in history. And some examples are genuinely incredibly compelling. The process of psychography, also known as automatic writing, is when mediums go into a trance, channeling a spirit of a deceased person and recording their words. One of the more famous examples of this in media is in the classic 1980 film The Changeling. A scene in that movie features a medium coming over to help George C. Scott's character investigate the strange activities he's been experiencing in his house. His character holds a seance where a medium channels the spirit of a sickly boy named Joseph Carmichael. One of the most chilling scenes in the entire picture comes when the medium falls into a trance, furiously writing and making marks on paper as if the ghost is using her to directly communicate with the room. Spirit writing has a long tradition throughout history and, indeed, all over the world. In China, mediums channeled written messages from various deities and spirits as far back as the Song Dynasty, which began in the year 960 to 1279. The 19th century saw a rise in Chinese salvationist religions derived from the practice of spirit writing. Meanwhile, in the 16th century, the West saw the birth of Enochian magic. This magic tradition was born when two men claimed that angels had dictated to them the Enochian language and thus a new way to practice magic. In 1872, one of Charles Dickens's novels was completed by automatic writing. And not by Dickens himself, but by his ghost. According to the Brattleboro Reformer, the story goes like this. In 1872, Thomas Power James, a printer who had recently moved into the Brattleboro area, was invited to commune with the dead in his friend's apartment. James was reportedly sceptical of the event, but became convinced of its great psychic power after a table waltzed into his lap during the spiritual gathering. James quickly moved from dancing with pieces of furniture to collaborating with the recently deceased Charles Dickens. Dickens, beloved English author and storyteller, had died in 1870 before completing his book The Mystery of Edwin Drood. Fans were left mid-story without answers to their pressing questions about the novel's murder. As the story goes, Dickens, a firm sceptic during his life, reached out to James during a private seance. The sad, desperate Dickens begged that James complete the mystery of Edwin Drood. James, in a series of dramatic, frenetic and heavily publicised sessions with the British author's ghost, channelled Dickens to finish writing the novel. After the novel's completion, Arthur Conan Doyle endorsed James's work and believed it was truly the result of a collaboration with Dickens's spirit. Much to James's dismay, Dickens's ghost was not satiated and insisted that James write another book for him, The Life and Adventures of Buckley Wickle Heap. The story of Buckley Wickle Heap was serialised in James's magazine, Summerland Messenger. However, only the second chapter survives. So, okay, perhaps that was not the most compelling example, but it is interesting that the psychography is linked to such prominent names within the literary community. Yeats, Conan Doyle, Dickens, albeit unwillingly. But there are contemporary psychographers that have really taken the world by storm, that have gripped the hearts of entire nations with their abilities. Today, we are going to deep dive into the world of Chico Xavier. But first, we need to briefly understand the difference between spiritism and spiritualism. So what's the difference between spiritism and spiritualism? Both believe in the existence of the spiritual world and the power that the spiritual world has on human beings. Both agree that we live on after death and that there is a world beyond the physical. Spiritual healing, psychics and clairvoyance are all part of both practices. 
But spiritualism existed long before spiritism, which is an offshoot of the popular movement. Spiritualism first came about in the 1840s when two sisters, the Fox sisters, claimed that they had the ability to communicate with spirits. They did so by using a tapping method to garner yes or no answers from beyond the grave. They were a sensation. Later in life, the Fox sisters admitted that this was a hoax and that they had done this by the ability to loudly crack their toe joints as well as some other clever tricks. They later rescinded this and went back to maintaining that their communication with the dead was real. But it didn't matter anymore. The truth of the matter was completely irrelevant. The concept of speaking with those beyond the grave became a worldwide phenomenon. Spiritism says that human beings are corporeal incarnations of spirits from the spiritual world. Practitioners long to learn how to live with spirits and achieve spiritual growth. One of the main aspects that separates the spiritualists from the spiritists is the belief in reincarnation. Spiritists are firm believers in the idea of reincarnation, while not all spiritualists do believe in reincarnation. But the fascination with the dead has continued for decades all around the world in both practices. One place where spiritism had a palpable impact is Brazil, where there exists the highest number of spiritists in the world. Spiritism in Brazil first gained prominence in the mid-1800s. The writings of French writer and educator Alan Kardec became the primary resource for those interested in the mediumship. Spiritism, according to Kardec, is a philosophy, a religion and a science. Brazilians interested in spiritism gravitated towards mediumship and communication with disembodied spirits. Spiritism is one of the fastest growing religions in Brazil, with 3.8 million members in 2010, and it is the third largest religious movement in Brazil. But in the 20th century, one spiritist set the world on fire with his astounding abilities, unbelievable gifts and undeniable charm. His name was Chico Xavier. Francisco Candido Xavier, known as Chico, was one of the most prolific and beloved mediums in the world. He was born in Pedro Leopoldo in Minas Gerais in Brazil on April 2nd, 1910. His father was a lottery ticket vendor and his mother was a housewife and a devout Catholic. At an early age, he began showing signs that he was gifted. It began when he and his father were having a conversation about pregnancy. Chico was four but somehow he began to tell his father complex scientific and biological facts about pregnancy. His father, naturally, was stunned. When he asked Chico how he knew this information, Chico told him innocently that he could hear and see spirits and they gave him lots of information. And after his mother died when he was only five years old, he claims to have kept up conversations with her for years. His father was concerned. This was not something that he felt equipped to deal with. He didn't understand whether his child was somehow abnormally intelligent or whether his child was mentally unwell. Chico attended public school and at the same time worked selling vegetables to help support his family. To be clear, this was not unusual. Children were expected to work whenever and wherever they could in order to help support their families. When Chico was seven years old, his father remarried and his father and stepmother went on to have six more children. Throughout his childhood, Chico would blame paranormal powers for getting him into trouble. One year at school, he claimed to have seen a man who told him what to write in all of his essays. But no one took him seriously, not even his teacher. After winning an essay contest at state level, he faced scepticism and accusations of plagiarism. In order to prove that he was not a fake nor guilty of plagiarism, he was challenged to write an essay about a grain of sand, a topic which he knew nothing about and did not prepare for. He succeeded in writing a competent essay on the subject. He was 12 years old, and again he claimed that a man, a spirit, dictated the essay to him. That display of spirit writing led his stepmother to ask him to ask the spirit of his late mother to help her deal with a pesky vegetable-stealing neighbour. 
The advice from the other realm actually helped to solve the family problem. The spirit allegedly advised Chico to advise his stepmother to invite the neighbour to come and help with the vegetable plot and to help selling the vegetables. And guess what? It worked. The neighbour stopped stealing the vegetables. When this advice from the other realm actually helped solve the family problem, his father became nervous. And in an unfortunate turn of events, he had Chico hospitalised. But luckily, after a quick examination from a Catholic priest, his father was advised to just restrict his reading and get him working. That would sort everything. So he started working in a textile factory. This work was very tough on him with extended hours and rigorous discipline. He worked all through the rest of his schooling and in 1924, he finished primary school at 14 years old. After leaving primary school, he never went back to school. Instead, he focused on his gift of speaking with the dead and the art of psychography. Chico Xavier's first meeting with a spiritualist happened in 1927, when he was 17 years old. Just two months after his first introduction to the movement, he began exercising his own mediumship publicly. Four years after going public with his gift, he began to channel a spirit that he called Emmanuel, who became his mentor. Chico attributes Emmanuel with the authorship of a large amount of his psychographic works. Chico, using Emmanuel, has composed several books in multiple languages. These books include historical romances, spiritual guidance and biblical interpretations. Between 1932 and 2002, he published over 400 books, selling 25 million copies worldwide. His works were translated into Greek, Japanese and Braille. In 1944, he published his spiritual memoir, No Solar, which became one of, if not the biggest books on the topic of psychography of all time. No Solar, which translates to Our Home from Portuguese to English, was a work that Chico claimed was dictated to him by a man named André Luiz. Louise was another famous figure in the world of spiritism. He was a medical doctor and a researcher who became a well-respected teacher, writer and leader. And he was dead. After his death, Chico told his story in No Solar. Chico maintained that the spirit of André Louise had come to him and dictated the story to him. The book describes Louise in neither heaven or hell after his death. Chico details life in the spiritual world operating as a reporter, detailing Louise's experience. The story features discarnate spirits, spirits with no physical body, being supervised by high-order spirits through journeys of recovery and spiritual education. The book is also known as Astral City, a spiritual journey which was made into a feature film directed by Wagner de Assis in 2010. In addition to his books, and perhaps more interestingly, he recorded over 10,000 letters from dead people, passing them along to their families. People travelled from all over Brazil to meet with him, in the hopes that he could communicate with their deceased loved ones for them. In many cases, he was visited by grieving mothers, longing to communicate with their children who passed. Some of the letters were written backwards, or in languages not spoken by Chico, but the letters were still convincing, even to sceptics. Chico was able to include intimate details of the deceased. In some instances, the letters he wrote with the help of the dead were used in court as evidence. In 1976, Jose Davino Nunez was being tried for murder. He was a teenager at the time and was accused of killing his best friend, Maurizio Garces. Maurizio Garces was 15 years old and Jose Davino was 18. It was Saturday, May the 8th, 1976. Maurizio opened a container that belonged to Jose's father. It contained some cigarettes and a gun. Maurizio believed the cartridges were empty. He playfully pointed the gun at Jose and then handed the gun to Jose. Jose pointed the gun, laughing, and pulled the trigger. Maurizio was shot in the chest. Jose and his mother immediately rushed him to the hospital, but he did not make it. 
Maurizio's parents were understandably devastated. They wanted justice. They wanted their son back. But they also felt sorry for Jose. They went to see Chico. They were hoping to find comfort and communication with their deceased son, hoping to find some sort of peace and closure. After a few meetings with the family, Chico was able to communicate with the deceased Maurizio Garces, writing a letter that he claimed came directly from the spirit. In the letter, the boy declared that the whole event was a terrible, tragic accident. The letter read, and I quote, Neither Jose Divino nor anyone else is guilty. If anyone should ask for forgiveness, it's me, because I shouldn't have been playing around instead of studying. His parents submitted this letter to the judge, presiding over the murder case. His name was Olimar de Bastos, and it was accepted as witness testimony. An expert allegedly analysed the handwriting and concluded that it was a match to the boy's handwriting, and the judge admitted the letter as evidence. The judge moved to acquit Divino and the jury agreed six votes to one. Jose Divino Nunez was no longer on trial for the murder of Maurizio Garces, all thanks to a psychographic letter written by Chico Xavier. Newspaper headlines declared that Chico saved an innocent from jail. Maurizio Garces' parents accepted the verdict and believed that their son wanted to save his friend from going to jail. In 1985, a retired military police sergeant named Francisco de Paula Dutra was shot and killed in Perdices City. His wife and daughter came to Chico eight months later, in the hopes to hear from their deceased husband and father. During the session, Chico wrote a 33-page letter where Francisco spoke in detail about the crime and said that he missed his family. The family claimed to have never told Chico about the crime. Chico knew nothing about how Francisco had died. Because he was able to write such details in the letters, the family became convinced that it was their loved one who was actually writing the letter through Chico. His daughter revealed that she had no doubt that it was her father's letter. The actress Nair Bello received a letter through Chico from her son Manuel after he died in a car accident in Sao Paulo. The letter she received contained information that only Manuel could know, including information about deceased people that his family could not even remember. These people mentioned in that letter had passed away many years before. Her husband had to travel back to his hometown of Limera City to ask his mother and aunts about some of the people brought up in the letter. And the information was accurate. And according to a 2020 article in Mysterious Universe on Mysterious Disappearances, parents consulted Chico over their missing children too. In June 1985, a strange case occurred in the Serra de Mantiqueira Mountains of Brazil. On June the 8th of that year, a young boy by the name of Marco Aurelio Simon was on a hiking excursion with his Boy Scout troop at a region called the Marins Peak. At the time, the boy was with an adult supervisor and three other boys, and at one point one of the boys injured his leg. It was decided to take him back to their base of operations. And since Simon was the fastest and the fittest, he went ahead in order to mark the trail with chalk to make navigation easier. However, at some point, Simon decided to go left at a fork in the trail while the rest went right. Which shouldn't have mattered since the trails reconverged on the other side. But the boy never did arrive and was never seen again. It seems like a pretty standard disappearance. But the paranormal element comes into play with the sighting that happened a bit later that evening. The entire troop would claim to see mysterious blue and red lights in the sky over the area where they had last seen Simon, and would only get spookier from there. Some of the other Boy Scouts would report hearing Simon's voice and his whistling through the trees not far from their base camp. Yet all attempts to call out to him were met by the sounds of the forest. A massive search would be launched of the area using aircraft and tracker dogs, but no sign of the missing boy was ever found. The parents even went to a famous Brazilian medium by the name of Chico Xavier, who implied that the boy had been spirited away by entities of some sort. It is worth noting that the area is supposedly a UFO hotspot. 
and one wonders whether something truly bizarre happened to Marco Aurelio Simon and where he went. By the 1970s, Chico Xavier was well known all throughout Brazil. Nearly a third of the population tuned in to watch a televised interview with Xavier. He appeared on the show Pinga Fogo and garnered the largest television audience in the country's history. The broadcast went long, over two hours. The interview was such a success, a follow-up interview the following year was scheduled. That interview went on for four hours and drew an estimated 20 million viewers. More than two million people signed a petition to nominate him for a Nobel Peace Prize in 1981. Although it may seem like this, on top of his popularity, meant that he didn't have any sceptics, there were still those who refused to believe his gifts were legitimate. And his popularity came at a price. Chico had to set up intense security around his house, including security cameras and even an electric fence, due to the high volume of uninvited visitors who would flock to his home in the hope of seeing him. One police officer has gone on record stating that he had saved Chico from several intruders, claiming that some people had jumped the walls. In one extreme case, one man made it all the way into Chico's bedroom. Chico built up a reputation for his humanitarian works. He often donated the proceeds from his books to charity and he did not charge people for the letters that he wrote. Instead, the money went to hospitals, nursing homes and daycare centres across Brazil. For decades, he distributed money and food to those in need. Chico claimed that the books never belonged to him. They belonged to those who dictated the words to him or chose to write through his hand. In the year 2000, two and a half million people from Minas Gerais voted to elect him the person of the century. Two years later, he died of cardiac arrest at the age of 92 on the 26th of June 2002. Just two weeks before he passed away, he asked to visit one of the kitchens that prepared food for the hungry. The visit was caught on camera. The images showed how loved he was in the community and how much his services meant for the lives that he touched. By the end of his life, he was blind in one eye, suffered from heart and lung problems and was bound to a wheelchair. His friend of 40 years, Denora, kept track of his medicines. His friend said that he had a peaceful death and was joking and drinking coffee until the very end. His wake lasted two full days, with thousands of people passing his coffin each hour. More than 30,000 people looked on as his funeral procession. The governor of Minas Gerais declared three official days of mourning after his passing. The Brazilian president at the time, Fernando Henrique Cardoso, called him a great leader who was loved and admired throughout Brazil, and a man who left his mark on the hearts of Brazilians. So being a poetry nerd, I had to include that little that little snippet of WB Yeats's life <laughs> in the beginning of this episode. So I, this might not interest other people, but I am fascinated by the lives of poets. Like I am fascinated by the life of Lord Byron, for example. And WB Yeats is another one of those poets that really fascinates me. So Yeats had basically been in love with a woman called Maud Gone for his whole life. He was like, please marry me. She was like, absolutely not. You're really whiny and moany and a bit annoying. So no. Then Yates proposed to Maud Gon's daughter, Isult Gon, and she was like, no, I'm not marrying you. Literally within a couple of weeks, he was married to Georgie Hyde Lees. And she sounds like a really interesting woman. So she was really well educated and really well read. And she knew loads about the paranormal. She also was in the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, which was this like super secret magic society that Yeats was in, along with Conan Doyle and along with Alistair Crowley. They were all in this secret society together. And I, I sort of always wondered whether she actually was able to do automatic writing or whether she just wanted to keep Yeats interested she definitely wasn't stupid and I think she saw on her honeymoon that Yates was sort of brooding and miserable about the fact that she wasn't Isult gone or Maud gone and she was like, fuck it, how can I make this man actually interested in me and want to keep me around? He had loads of affairs. At one point he was like, your name Georgie is stupid so he insisted on calling her George for the rest of their marriage. As another aside... 
um, WB Yeats and Alistair Crowley really hated each other. And I think from doing reading about Alistair Crowley and about WB Yeats, I think Crowley, like he wanted to be recognised as a poet, like he really wanted to be recognised as a poet. And he just wasn't seen to be as good as poets like Yeats. I think there was a bit of jealousy there. And Yeats didn't like the way that Crowley conducted himself. He didn't like the lifestyle that Crowley encouraged, etc. And of course, the lifestyle that he indeed lived. This culminated in them having a magic battle. I'm not I'm not making that up. That's not an exaggeration. Yeats and his crew, <laughs> this is so stupid, kicked Alistair Crowley out of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, right? And Alistair Crowley went to the founder and was like, please, can you give me some spells that will make these men want to be friends with me? And the founder was like, yeah, and he gave them he gave him some spells. And then Alistair Crowley went back to their secret headquarters and he (laughs) was asked to leave. So he was at the bottom of the stairs shouting these spells at these men at the top of the stairs, you know, because he wanted to be friends with them. And it was Yates and a couple of other people were there and they were like shouting spells back at him. It's it's also important to note at this point that Crowley is dressed on the advice of um, the guy who started the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. He is dressed as some sort of Celtic pagan druid at this point. In the end, Yates kicks Crowley down the stairs and he is escorted off the premises. That's a total aside. That's not relevant to anything. I just find that little tidbit of information really fascinating and Yates sounds like he was he was pretty much a knob to Georgie Hyde Lees for all of his life. So Georgie Hyde Lees was also the muse she was the inspiration for some of the imagery and metaphors that are used in Yeats's poems. I wonder if he would have accepted those as freely if they had come from Georgie Hyde Lees and not from some spirit that was being channeled through her. Just a a thought, just an aside. Also, I think it's really interesting. I love the story about the Dickens novel, the guy who finished the Dickens novel because Dickens was like channeled through him. Um, I didn't know that before I started researching for this episode and I thought it was really interesting. But what else I thought was really amusing was that people keep writing that Dickens was a skeptic in his life and... Therefore, that would mean that he couldn't possibly, he couldn't possibly have been channeled through this man in order to write the end of this novel, which I think is such a mad thing to say. Just because you're a skeptic in life, I don't think that means that you would continue being skeptical in death. If Dickens' spirit, if the spirit of Charles Dickens is dead, right, and he's bopping around in the afterlife and he's like, oh my God, I have this ability to to channel through this man and finish writing this novel that I really wanted to write or or even if it's not that even if it's I have this ability to haunt people or I have this ability to appear to people oh but wait I was a skeptic in life so I probably can't do that or I probably shouldn't do that it wouldn't really be fitting wouldn't be in keeping with the whole reputation that I've built while I was alive I'm pretty sure that's not how the afterlife would work if if the afterlife is real. So on to the story of Chico Xavier. I knew nothing about Chico Xavier. I hadn't heard of him. I'm not up to date on the spiritualism or spiritism world and the people that are the kind of big players in that world. But it really does sound like Chico Xavier's abilities genuinely impacted people. I would be interested to know how much of his biography is actually true. So, you know, we hear these stories about him being kind of gifted in his early life. He's writing these crazy essays. He claims it's being dictated to him by spirits. He seems to have this ability to communicate with the dead, etc., etc. So much so that his father puts him into a hospital, although it seems like a really almost cruel, callous thing to do. I can totally understand why his father would have done that because he probably was really frightened and his child was talking about all these seemingly out there, crazy, wild things. I can I can understand. Um, I think it's also mad that a priest just came along and went, no, he's fine. Just stop him from reading and make him work hard. That'll fix everything. But I wonder how much of these stories about his childhood are true or how many of these stories are kind of put out there by Chico himself in order to kind of prove that he had been gifted from a young age 
we see this with many mediums. Um, I've I've met many mediums who have told me stories about their childhood and about things that have happened to them when they were children that they didn't realize at the time were due to mediumship. But now as adults, they can see it's due to mediumship. And the thing is, I, I, you don't know if those stories are true or if they are stories that are exaggerated or even just outright made up in order to support their current claims. I think it's also important to say as well that there are a lot of people who are skeptical of Chico Xavier. So in the in the show notes for this episode, there is a link to a Skeptical Inquirer article that calls out Chico Xavier and some of his hoaxes as they claim they are. So apparently people that worked for Chico Xavier claimed that they were instructed to find out as much information as possible from clients. So these people would come along and they would write letters to Chico or they would come and visit them. And it would be it would be people's job to go around and speak to these people and gather as much information as possible about them, report that information back to Chico. And then, of course, it would look like Chico was, you know, getting this information from beyond the grave. And the people would either forget that they had given that information already to somebody else or they just wouldn't realize these people were working for Chico Xavier. But I will also say that that article in in Skeptical Inquirer literally says, and this is a direct quote from that article, it says, A close friend of mine, Vitor Mora Visoni, managed to get one of Xavier's biggest and closest associates, Waldo Vieira, to clearly state that Xavier promoted hoaxes. Vieira should know because he was there. Workers from the Spiritist Centre went to the line of followers to get details from the deceased, or they used stories told by relatives in the letters where they asked for a meeting. The messages from Chico had this information, Vieira revealed. That would explain his psychographed letters with details that only the deceased had known. More than cold reading, this was just plain hoaxing. So I think it's really interesting that this says a close friend of mine, whoever managed to get one of Xavier's biggest and closest associates, Waldo Vieira, to clearly state that Xavier promoted hoaxes. I think that wording is really interesting. Managed to get it sort of feels like there was some coercion to get him to talk. It feels a bit like Spanish Inquisition-y. You know what I mean? Like he managed to get him to to admit that he was hoaxing. We don't know what circumstances he admitted this under or we don't know what was used in order to get him to admit to this and I don't know if one person admitting something is enough to say that all of this man's alleged abilities were hoaxed or untrue. This same person then went on to say that during a lot of seances smells would feature very prominently so people would smell flowers and they would believe that this was their loved one who had returned to communicate with them and on one of these days this this person who revealed the hoax went to a closet because the door was open and he went to close it and when he got to the closet he saw that there in the closet were were, was a bag full of flasks um perfumes perfumes basically perfumes that smelled of fresh roses and this person allegedly confronted Chico and he he burst into tears and uh, had been found out right and I just feel again it's very easy to go ha ha on the word of one person and I don't think that is maybe I don't think that's enough to prove that Chico was hoaxing all the things that he did there is a a <laughs> <laughs> there is a, a bit of a chaotic picture that is in that Skeptical Inquirer article as well that is allegedly meant to be a picture of Chico Xavier with a ghost, um, the ghost of a nun called Sister Josefa. And uh, it's very clearly a woman with a sheet over her. Very clearly. And it's very much reminiscent of the... <laughs> it's very much reminiscent of the story of Helen Duncan, the wartime witch who would you know, vomit ectoplasm and stuff. And it turns out it was just like cheesecloth and with pictures of people sewn onto them. Uh, That's not, it's not a great look, I would say. And um, if you want to go look at those pictures, they are, the link is obviously in the description of this episode. It's the Skeptical Inquirer link. And that, that doesn't, that doesn't put them in a great light because I, I don't know if there's any way of saying that that isn't an outright hoax that they were clearly aware of when they took these pictures. 
it's just it's clearly a woman with a sheet over her head and not only that but it's clearly a woman um, a psychic medium who chico xavier used to work with like it's it's very it's very clearly her but here's the thing about this right even though there are people who have gone out of their way to try and prove that this was hoaxed and it wasn't true there isn't any evidence to suggest that that he wasn't a good guy like chico xavier seems to have done all of these charitable acts that have been you know laid out about his life he seems to have given lots to the needy he apparently lived really modestly dedicated his life to to psychography and trying to help people he seems to have been generally decent like it doesn't seem that he profited all that much from the books and from the letters that he wrote for people I also think that it is important to note that the court case in which the letter was submitted as evidence is actually more complex than I wrote about, but I was reading a translated version. So I was reading a version that was originally written in Portuguese and I was reading a translated to English version and it was tricky to decipher because often, you know, direct translations don't actually give the meaning and it it is slightly more complex to try and understand This court case went on for literally years, as far as I could see. And from what I could gather, yes, the judge accepted the letter as evidence, but apparently then there was a retrial. So after the judge was like, yeah, brilliant, we will accept this letter as evidence. I think afterwards, like the prosecution services or whoever, I don't know how the court system works in Brazil. They went, no, you can't, you can't use evidence from a man who claims that the ghost of the deceased, the ghost of the victim wrote a letter. That's that. No, that doesn't come within the confines of what is legally right to be used in evidence. We're, we're not accepting that. And I think the case was reopened and then, you know, and the, and the boy, the, the um, 18 year old was still found not guilty. And it did make me wonder how much Chico's involvement in that story is potentially exaggerated or taken slightly out of context to again prove the point that he was this great brilliant psychographer it reminded me of the modern association of ed and lorraine warren with the devil made me do it case when actually they had very limited involvement in that particular case in reality and this again is just one of those cases that makes me go who's benefiting and who's being hurt by this i mean when when stuff is is kind of being used in a court of law i think it takes on a bit of a sinister tone i think that's a bit of a a a dangerous situation to be in i don't know obviously i don't know what happened none of us were there when the boy was shot by his friend we don't know if it was accidental etc etc but by the court of law he was found not guilty And it's difficult to say at what point we should judge or kind of not believe somebody like Chico Xavier, because clearly he brought a lot of closure to families. He clearly brought a lot of peace to families. And sometimes is that worth more than the truth? I don't really know. And I kind of came away from this thinking, is it possible that he did genuinely have gifts and then struggled to keep up with the huge demand? If you've got thousands of people who are clambering to see you and desperate to get some sort of some sort of meeting with you and you're trying to see as many people as possible do you then start hoaxing things because you want to help as many people as possible but you don't have the capacity to be able to see all those people and genuinely receive a message from beyond the grave I don't know let me know what you think. I'm dying to know if you've got thoughts about the story of Chico Xavier or if you know more about it than I do because listen, I did not know anything about this story. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. If you would like to send in your story, you can do so by emailing it to reallifeghoststoriespodcast at gmail.com. You can also check out the website reallifeghoststoriespodcast.com and if you are desperate for some extra content, you can subscribe to the Patreon. That is patreon.com forward slash stories, where for $5 a month or $2 a month, you get access to heaps of extra content as well as every single main and mini episode completely ad free. And on that note, I shall see you next time. Head over to Hulu this March, where our new shows and movies will keep you streaming all month long. 
Catch the award-winning movie Poor Things, starring Emma Stone, Mark Ruffalo, and Willem Dafoe. Check out the new documentary, Freaknik, The Wildest Party Never Told, about the iconic Atlanta street party. And don't miss FX's Shogun, a reimagining of the epic tale starring Anna Sawai. So, what are you waiting for? Go stream something new on Hulu.